My name is Mary. Um, I'm from Berkeley, California. I just graduated from University of California at Berkeley. Um, some of you may know me online as Cleander on the Avon forums or on Tumblr and WordPress. I'm Next Step Cake. Um, so kind of continue from here. My kind of interest is looking at what I jokingly sometimes call asexual prehistory, which is basically asexuality before we start having things like Avon forums, where we have all this kind of reported forums and reported emails that we can look at. Um, kind of stuff, it's before the things that we all have in living memory. So kind of, I want to talk about, when we talk about the origin of asexuality, like where did asexuality start? Where do we start talking about asexual history? Um, in different narratives of asexual history, there's many different starting points. One common one is starting with uh, the release of Bogart's, Anthony Bogart released a uh, study in 2004, which had kind of famous figure that estimated that approximately 1% of the population uh, of Britain did not experience sexual attraction. And this also kind of picked off a bunch of new supports, including in The New Scientist and in CNN about kind of new phenomenon of asexuals. And that was kind of one of the first times that asexuality, at least in the last 10 years, really started to become known outside of some small asexual community. Uh, other narratives start a little earlier, they say. Um, well, you know, by the time the Bogart's article was published in Making the Rounds, they thought to communities like Avon had already existed for a while. So others trace um, the modern era of asexuality back to the creation of Avon, which has been for the last couple of years the largest and most influential asexual organization. Um, others go back even further and they say, like, hey, when did we have the first kind of asexual communities of any kind? Um, many of which look at, say, the Haven for the Human Amoeba, which was an email list created in about 2000, year 2000, which was kind of one of the first places that asexuals could really connect. It was one of the first kind of established communities for asexuality. Others look even further back, going back to approximately 1997, is one of kind of the first well-known appearances of discussion about asexuality on the internet in, a, in an online article titled My Life is Human Amoeba. And that comment section is kind of one of the first places we see people having back and forth exchanges talking about asexuality on the internet. But one thing to notice about this list is everything is on the internet. Um, also, everything on this list is pretty much talking about specifically the development of asexual communities. That is, when you have people saying like, hey, I'm asexual. Hey, you're asexual. Let's talk about this. <coughs> However, if you're going to look at not just the evolution of asexual communities, but about the history of kind of asexuality in general, it actually turns out to be a much longer history. Um, so I want to discuss some kind of a very, very broad overview of what, how I kind of like to break up the stages of discussing the history of sexuality. So it starts with some of the earliest stuff that we just saw in, the, in uh, I think it was presentation, things like um, stuff from Hirschfeld in the late 1800s, all these things that are sort of not really quite what we consider asexuality today yet, but they are hints of kind of that growth coming. Um, that period also includes things like the Kinsey reports, um, and in general, the whole kind of development of the psychological field of sexuality and discussion of sexuality in terms of attraction, in terms of desire, all of which would kind of eventually set the stage for the concept of asexuality to emerge. Um, and then the period that I'm going to be talking about is what I call um, kind of the period where we start to see something much more like the modern concept of asexuality first emerging. This is when we see people consistently using the term asexual as opposed to some of these other terms like anapathous sexualis or like sexual anorexia, which are terms that we don't really use anymore. Um, and then more recent history that I won't be talking about, but that's kind of useful to know, I would like to break it down into a period of about 1997 to 2004 is when the first internet of communities are appearing, including Avon. Um, but before 2004, there's still a lot more diversity in terms of where people are interacting. Um, but then by about 2004, the in asexual internet community has pretty much consolidated around AVEN as the central point. And so this kind of a period from, I would say about 2004 to 2010, I would like to call sometimes the age of AVEN, in which asexual discourse is kind of state, that's when we get a lot of the discourse now, romantic orientations, of the kind of lack of sexual attraction definition all being standardized by AVEN and AVEN affiliated communities. And then kind of going on right now is what I see as kind of the greater diversification of asexuality in terms of new spaces turning up like active communities on Facebook and Tumblr that are kind of diverging from Avon and increasing offline spaces in places like Toronto, and San Francisco, New York, and London, a lot of these offline groups forming that aren't necessarily tied into centralized forums like Avon. Um, so, having said that, um, 
I'm kind of looking backwards and I'm specifically looking at the period from roughly 1970 to 1983, focusing on the last couple years of the 1970s. Um, this project originally started as my senior thesis at UC Berkeley, um, looking kind of generally at the history of this period in the late 1970s, looking at examples largely from news media, so that's newspapers, including articles, letters to the editor, comments like that. The other source that was good for looking for these kind of traces of asexual history was looking at academic articles, which are easy to find because they're indexed. Um, one of the most helpful things in doing this is the existence of digitized newspaper archives. Because when you're trying to look about asexuality, you can't be like, oh, well, I'm just gonna, I know this event happened here, so I'll look at these from this time. It's a lot of mass searching, going through archives, and you're like, I'm gonna look up every appearance of the word asexual, cross out all the ones that are biology, cross out all the ones that are unrelated. Um, and one thing that's really interesting is when you start doing these searches, for example, you find all of this stuff that one would have thought never existed, uh, considering the common silence about this period. Um, so kind of general results of looking through all these files is that despite the kind of common perception that asexuality is a very new movement and that the concept didn't really exist before even, we actually find that there are examples of people discussing asexuality, people identifying as asexual, going back to the early 1970s. Um, and in particular, the period of, kind of 1977 to 1979 saw a big spike both in publications of academic articles on asexuality and in news references to asexuality which is kind of an interesting parallel to the same thing that we see happen again in 2004 and 2006, where we have the Bogart academic article and things like the New Scientist article kind of making a breakthrough of Avon. So I think it's kind of interesting to see this is kind of almost a forgotten period of kind of asexual um, So first I wanted to kind of talk about what I found in terms of looking at academic articles. So these are things like journal publications, these are books, um, mostly coming from psychology and sociology. Uh, in general, mentions of asexuality from this period fall into a few categories. First, one of the good places that we see mentions of asexuality are in attempts to classify sexual orientation. Um, for example, many things that are finding, like, trying to find question sets to determine whether someone is, say, homosexual, bisexual, heterosexual, or, as some of these studies included, asexual. Um, other areas where we see discussions of asexuality include discussions of sexual dysfunction. Um, this is a period where there was a lot of activity around kind of trying to medicalize and standardize a lot of mental illnesses, including a lot of kind of these sexual paraphilia and sexual dysfunctions, uh, especially in the Diagnostics and Statistics Manual, which is kind of the Bible of the APA in terms of listing out uh, mental illnesses and mental disorders. Uh, another one is Another kind of frequent place they show up occasionally is many articles about, say, homosexuality or um, articles about like transgender people would include mentions of asexuality as of asexuality as kind of a subtype of person within these groups, uh, rather than as kind of an independent group, which is an interesting thing. Uh, something you may have guessed, kind of from what I mentioned earlier, is that one of the themes is in this period before we have the standardizing effects of Avon, the definition of the way the term asexual use is much looser. It can refer to anything from lack of sexual attraction to lack of sexual desire um, to simple lack of sex, like sexual intercourse or sexual behavior. Um, it's also given usually a much broader definition rather than having no attraction at all. Um, it's often described as anyone kind of on the lower end of the scale in terms of sexual attraction, sexual desire, etc. Um, so we can see that although the definition hasn't really settled into the way that it will eventually be settled by the creation of Avon and kind of standardizing effects that have, you do see a lot of studies kind of coming to this discussion of asexuality as a sexual orientation, asexuality as the lack of attraction or desire, and a lot of the language that kind of we use now is first appearing in this time period. Um, one other thing to note though is, at least in terms of academic work, we mostly have examples of what we kind of describe as possible asexuals, which is these are not people who are saying, like, hey, I identify as asexual. These are people who researchers look at and go, based on your answers to these questions, we're going to categorize you as asexual. So from there, we don't really know whether people were starting to identify themselves as asexual. Where we do get that information is from asexuality in news media. So this, um, we have a variety of things that we can look at for evidence of asexuality in terms of looking at news media. One of the big ones is kind of most frequently is what I call kind of evidence of like proof of concept. The idea that looking for evidence that asexuality was a concept that existed and that people were expected to understand. A lot of this comes from small bits of evidence. So it might be things like 
talking about, maybe an article about gay rights, it, enlisting sexual orientations is like, oh, and the rights of heterosexuals, homosexuals, bisexuals, asexuals. And then quite frequently these articles will never mention asexuality again. But just the fact that it's included, often without explanation, gives us an indication that yes, this was a concept that existed then. Furthermore, this is a concept that people could reasonably be expected to understand, or at least kind of infer the length of definition of it. Um, so that's kind of something interesting to see crop up. Um, and including that, we've also what's kind of gives us a lot more information, or we have actually several full-length articles specifically about the issue of asexuality. Um, we'll show some examples later. Um, one of the other interesting that shows up is there's actually frequently parody articles. Um, for example, there's several articles that talk about, like Lisa quote, like, oh, the asexual militant movement or the asexual rights movement, which are not actually, uh, not, many of them are intended to be satires of the gay rights movement, for example. But what's interesting is in many of these parodies, although they were intended as satire, they get sincere responses in terms of letting the editors, et cetera, from people who are saying like, oh my god, I identify as sexual. Thank you so much for talking about this issue. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of interesting in the way that kind of satire, although it, the, the article itself doesn't really tell us much about sexuality since it was intended as a fiction, the responses do illuminate a lot for us. Um, although that is also kind of one of the difficulties in looking at asexual history. Sometimes we cannot tell to what extent statements and articles are true and to what extent they are satire um, without explicit statements. Um, so that is kind of one of the issues. Um, generally, also some of the kind of interesting themes that talk of, that crop up um, in these articles about asexual and news media um, it's just kind of, I think it's something that gives us some insight into kind of why this is happening now, why the 70s, um, are the frequent allusions to first uh, recent or ongoing psychological theories and study of sexuality, especially talking about kind of the rise of sex therapy, which is kind of becoming a popular trend around this time. And in these articles, uh, things like quotes from sex therapists talking about the different problems that people come in, say like, yeah, and then there's some of these people who come in, um, like reporting these no sexual desire, and they're like, no, I seem fine with it, but it just seems weird, so I came in. Um, so the other references, there's a lot of kind of comparing the asexual movement to the gay rights movement, um, which is, if you remember, like Stonewall was in 1969, which is kind of often seen as the kind of moment when gay rights kind of went mainstream. That was when it got kind of a lot of attention, um, and then the kind of gay rights movement slowly grew there. So the 70s is also when the gay rights movement is kind of coming into full swing, and then a lot of articles about asexuality kind of tie onto this, like, heard this sexual orientation, but what about this one? Now I just wanted to kind of talk about a couple of examples, both from uh, academia and news. I won't have time to go into the full details, but if you want information on any of these, or if you'd be interested in getting links on any of them, uh, feel free to contact me afterwards. Um, so, there's so in terms of examples, um, I'm just going to really brief one through. These are some of the kind of more interesting examples. Uh, in 1997, there's an article by Myra T. Johnson, which is really fascinating. It's called Asexual and Autoerotic Auto Women, Two Invisible Groups. Uh, and in this article, what the author Johnson did is they went through women's magazine articles, looking for letters to the editor, submissions, uh, women's quotes and columns, all about talking about their kind of own lack of sexual desire. Uh, the article also discusses kind of public reactions to this. Um, for example, the common assumptions that these asexual people might face. Um, the article is, I would say, like almost prophetic in the issues it discusses. Um, for example, it discusses the ways that asexuals are often mistaken for being like religious celibates. And, but often, asexual is often mistaken for a statement of like religious purity. Um, or on the other end, it talks about how asexuality is sometimes assumed to be, say, like part of the radical feminist separatist agenda. Um, whereas the testimony from actual asexual people mostly indicates that they're just like, I'm not interested, everyone says I should be interested, what's going on? Um, although not the people in the sample identified themselves as asexual, their descriptions are basically what we would consider asexuality now. Um, and like, if you have a chance to read this article, I really recommend it, because it's, it literally reads like it's been written, been written yesterday. Um, some other kind of known examples, Bell and Weinberg have a book called Homosexualities, which is kind of one of these examples of talking about asexuality as a subtype of, say, homosexuality. They divide kind of homosexuals into like, say, like five different categories. One of which is they asexual homosexuals, which are those who have few sexual relationships or, or less interest in uh, sexual acts and sexual desire. Um, 
And so that's kind of an example of something that's very different from the way that we categorize the sexuality today, an example kind of the diversity of them. Um, other big ones, Storms, you may have heard of. He was one of the big first people to kind of use that four orientation model of homosexuality, heterosexuality, bisexuality, asexuality. Um, Kaplan, Helen Singer Kaplan, um, was a writer who kind of was very influential in terms of how sexual disorders um, are kind of viewed. She was very influential in, promote, in discussing the idea of desire as an essential part of kind of the sexual process and also therefore the lack of sexual desire as a major kind of psychological problem was something that comes from a lot of her writing. Um, yeah, there's another article from Storms. Um, and then slightly later we can see another example in Nurius, which is again looking at studies of people and then sorting them by their orientation. Um, and then just to kind of look at some examples from asexuality in the media, if you look at these dates, you notice 1978 and 1979, and 1979 are kind of the big years also as with academia, so this is kind of this bubble of interest. Um, whereas the academic articles kind of taper off after about 1983. Uh, I don't have them all here, but asexual media is notable that, especially in terms of things like letters to advice columnists, we have examples of those kind of trickling all the way up through the 90s up to the actual creation of these sexual communities. Um, I don't have time to go over all of these, but I wanted to just kind of show you just like a couple of quick screenshots of some of these things, uh, although we don't, we don't have time to go over them. But for example, this is an article that was published in the New York Times in 1978. It was later resyndicated re to dozens of other newspapers, um, so it got a lot of attention. Um, this is one that talked about kind of Asexuality as similar to basically celibacy, um, temporary celibacy, but also what we have referred to today. So it's a mix of both temporary lack of desire due to certain personal circumstances, all the way to lifelong lack of sexual desire and having no problem with it. Um, kind of other big ones. This is an interesting one. There's an article by sexual. It was on the front page of the fold of the Village Voice, which is um, a fairly big alternative newspaper in New York. So this is something that's like this is not just like tucked away in the back pages. This was making big news. This would have been seen by thousands of people. Um, this is just kind of an example of one example of a letter to an advice columnist that's talking about kind of asexuality and asexual issues. Um, this is kind of out of time, but just a couple other interesting things. Here we have examples of the models of the source model of asexuality that I mentioned that includes asexuality as one of four sexual orientation types. Um, this is from the chapter of Helen Singer Kaplan's book that discusses uh, desire, sexual desire disorders. Uh, in this chapter also discusses asexuality. Uh, here we have, as I mentioned, asexual and autoerotic women uh, from Myra P. Johnson. So, kind of, I guess some of the questions that we have left is, we're at the point where, okay, how will this evidence of sexual necessity? There's kind of a couple questions, right? First, why did this show up now? Uh, why, why the 1970s? What was big about that? Um, and that's something that kind of ongoing research project for me. Right now, my kind of personal hypotheses are that first, this was a period where you had kind of the rise in the kind of diagnostic, uh, I guess, but in kind of the psychological view of sexuality and psychological discussions of sexuality, normative sexuality, and sexual disorders, and kind of talking about that. Um, also, some hypotheses are that in terms of the sexual liberation of the 60s, kind of almost like to a backlash of people saying like, hey, there's all this sexual liberation going on, but what about me? Um, and finally, I think one of the last kind of influential things at this period was again, the rise of gay rights and in general this discussion of kind of sexual orientation and sexual diversity. And I think in the 70s, it's just time when kind of these all came to a head. And then I guess the other thing or question that we have is kind of, what has changed? Like, why did even not appear in the 70s instead of now? Um, and my kind of personal thoughts for that is, basically the internet. One of the, persistent, <laughs> one of the persistent themes that we see in all of these news articles, academic articles, are narratives of loneliness, of not being able to find anyone. Lots of letters to others are like, hey, can like, someone please write to me? I've like, never found another asexual person, even though I know they exist. Um, but it's then this persistent theme of an input connect. And then that's something that all changes when we get the internet. That's when we see people kind of reaching out and being like, hey, is there anyone else out there? And they get responses.